Thanks for joining us on Power Lunch. This is Bloomberg Quint and I'm Ira Dugal. Let's get you the headlines. Indian markets look set to close the week on a negative note. The Nifty falls 50 points as pharma and auto stocks struggle. The entertainment slumps more than 5%. Hexavare Technologies buys US-based Mobiquity uh, for $182 million. Uh, CEO uh, tells us that the deal will boost Hexavare's banking and pharmaceutical verticals. Credit rating agencies will now have to make more disclosures about the quality of debt instruments they rate. This as SEBI looks to streamline processes in the wake of a series of defaults. And WeWorks is considering a $1.9 billion deal to take majority control of its Indian affiliate. That's a Bloomberg News exclusive. All right, markets first. Yatin is here with us as always. Afternoon, Yatin. Uh, good afternoon, Neera. And, uh, you know, uh, persistently for the last uh, few trading sessions, uh, the markets are under pressure. In fact, today also we are seeing a 50-point cut coming in on the Nifty 50. Uh, and, uh, you know, in general, we have seen the Sensex and the Nifty Bank also remain under pressure. As far as uh, top gainers are concerned, we have seen a sharp intraday recovery. As far as Yes Bank is concerned, that stock from the red has moved into the green. 3% uh, up for that one. And if, if you look at the intraday chart also for Yes Bank, uh, that stock has been showing some, uh, you know, strength on an intraday basis. Infratel, ONGC, Tata Steel being the other gainers in trade. So Metal Pack uh, has been doing well in the marketplace today. On the flip side, uh, we have Indescent Bank, which continues to slide. That stock is down 4%. Z also was down as much as 7%. Has seen some recovery from the day's low, but that stock is still down 5% under pressure. 335 is where the stock is trading at. Also, we have Kotak Bank and Bajaj Auto uh, being the top losers as far as the Nifty 50 is concerned. What ac what's active in trade? Uh, we have India Bulls, Housing Finance, and after the promoters removed uh, certain pledge shares of, uh, you know, with the financial institution, that stock uh, saw some rebound intraday. Also, Group Finance, after the block deal, is quite active. Uh, 292 is where the stock is trading, down 5%. However, has it recovered from the day's low where the block deal actually took place. Uh, Big Boy Reliance Industries is down almost 1%. Uh, Divan Housing is down 3%. And Reliance Capital, uh, the other active NBFC, that stock is down nearly 6% as we speak. All right, uh, Yatin, thanks so much for that. A uh, brief note on macro data that came through. This is the wholesale price index. Uh, the uh, WPI inflation number fell to a 22-month low in May, uh, coming in at 2.45%. Uh, the expectation was a number closer to 3%. Uh, and even on a comparative basis, 2.45 compared to last month's 3.07% uh, is certainly lower. Just briefly glancing at what uh, has helped uh, bring this index down, uh, the uh, primary articles group uh, rose a marginal 0.2%. Uh, there was no change in the food articles group on a wholesale basis, which is surprising because at a retail level, food prices have been rising. Uh, the non-food articles group, though, did rise uh, by about 0.9%. Uh, some of the other segments that are closely watched, manufactured products, inflation uh, rose, uh, well, just 0.1%, so essentially was flat. Uh, reiterating what we know from the CPI numbers and the core CPI numbers, uh, that there isn't uh, much pr demand side pressure uh, that is showing up on the inflation side. So uh, subdued numbers, uh, even the retail numbers uh, on inflation have been subdued. Uh, let's move on. Uh, market regulator SEBI has come out with new guidelines for credit trading agencies. The new rules require the agencies to put out more disclosures uh, on a number of items, including the cumulative default rates and liquidity indicators as well. Uh, let me uh, first go across to my uh, colleague Adwait Rao, uh, who gives us a summary of uh, the guidelines that came out on uh, Thursday. The Securities and Exchange Board of India has published a new guideline for enhanced disclosures by credit rating agencies. These new guidelines come after criticism received from investors and promoters regarding sudden or quick downgrades or revision ratings revisions by the credit rating agencies in the cases of stressed or defaulting corporates. As part of these enhanced disclosures, the credit rating agencies will now have to publish a cumulative default rate on an annual basis. This will be both for long-term and short-term instruments and will be based on their one-year, two-year and three-year default rates for the various debt instruments that they rate. The second new disclosure that will need to be made is a liquidity indicator. Back in November, SEBI had told CRAs to include a liquidity section in their ratings releases. They have taken this a step further by telling the credit rating agencies to publish a liquidity indicator as part of their ratings releases, which would range from poor liquidity, adequate liquidity, strong liquidity, and stretched liquidity. The third new change is a new suffix that the market regulators introduced, which is titled CE or credit enhancement. 
Post CRAs publish an SO or structured obligation suffix next to the creating, uh, credit rating when a debt instrument is backed by assets or securities. But to bring in more transparency, the market regulator has introduced this new CE suffix so for credit rating agencies to assign to debt instruments when they are backed by different forms of credit enhancements such as guarantees. The fourth new change is the probability of default rate that credit rating agencies will have to publish from the 31st of December this year onwards. But companies tell us that this is a new criteria that has been introduced globally as well. So therefore they will take some time to work out the details on how to publish and measure the probability of default rate with the market regulator. The fourth change is that credit rating agencies and the market regulator will have to work on a standard operating procedure on when and how to recognize defaults and when to publish those ratings revisions when a corporate defaults on its debt obligations. All right, uh, let's get some clarity on uh, what this actually means because some of this uh, stuff is fairly technical. Joining us on the phone line to help us talk it through is Amit N. Tandon, MD of IIS, a long-time veteran of the rating industry as well. Amit, thanks for joining us. Uh, we have a lot of uh, sort of explanatory questions for you more than anything else. Uh, so uh, I have my first question is on this new formula that they are talking about for the computation of a cumulative default rate. Uh, is it substantially different from what is followed right now? Uh, not, uh, not. There are some. Uh, first, uh, the idea in, is to bring uh, some degree of consistency between the rating agencies. Uh, most of them are kind of following it, but there are some differences. So, for instance, uh, uh, I look at it in three ways. The first is the fact that uh, you know this time they're kind of saying that give us a combined. Uh, default statistics for structured obligations as well as what your regular loans are. Uh, the rating agencies so far have kind of disclosed these separately. SEBI is saying, look, a AAA needs to mean the same thing, whether you're lending money to a bank, whether you're lending money to a mortgage-backed security, or whether you're lending money to an auto manufacturer. So the AAA needs to be a AAA, and therefore we want the uh, statistics to kind of combine everything. The second uh, difference is that, uh, you know, different agencies have kind of got these little bit of quirks in as much as uh, one agency might say that, look, uh, if it's a corporate loan, even if it's an SO, it would be in the corporate default statistics, but if it is a structured obligation, it would be structured. Uh, another agency might say anyone which has the uh, suffix SO will be in the uh, structured uh, default statistics, and it comes there. Uh, the third big change is, you know, how do you uh, kind of uh, uh, come get the numbers? And by that, two things. One is withdrawal of ratings. They've said, look, if it's a withdrawal, uh, you can exclude it. Uh, but uh, over the last few years, they've kind of tightened the definition of when you can have a withdrawal. Uh, the second uh, aspect here is they've kind of said that, look, uh, at the end of the day, to kind of get the denominator right, you can use only three ratings. So if you've kind of uh, rated a bank, for instance, you could have the uh, advanced tier one and the base rating. You can't say that, look, I've got seven instruments and therefore my base rate goes up by seven and therefore uh, I get better numbers out there. So in a sense, they've kind of ensured that all the rating agencies uh, do have a consistent methodology uh, going forward. This monthly static pool, Amit, again, I think Crystal said that they used to do it in any case, which is that, you know, if some yeah. uh, rating is expired, it still gets counted uh, uh, within that pool. Is that yeah. what it means? Yeah. So what has happened is that, look, my sense is that uh, at least those with global affiliations, uh, Crystal, Ikra and India ratings would be following the methodology which is uh, consistent with what happens globally and which is what all firms do. Uh, I'm not uh, I don't have the details for how the domestic firms are doing it, but uh, yeah, it's kind of again, as you said, it's uh, a practice which is already being followed. Okay. What do you make of this introduction of the probability of default benchmarks for uh, credit rating agencies? Firstly, uh, to your understanding, what what, uh, what is it intended to do? Look, uh, that's an interesting thing because uh, my view is, uh, all along has been that look, you get that probability of default. It's a uh, uh, ex ante calculation rather than uh, ex post. So you you can't say that, look, uh, a company A, there's a 2% uh, probability of default and therefore it's going to be, uh, you know, a double A rating. Uh, 
uh, what you have to do is get the numbers and then kind of say that look, uh, our statistics, uh, if it's a double A, uh, this is the probability of default. But now what uh, SEBI is trying to do is make uh, the rating agencies a lot more accountable. And, uh, you know, one of uh, the constant grouses against the rating agencies has been that they're far too backward looking. But what they're trying to do here is to say that, look, if you're a triple A, uh, from the time of assigning the rating or reaffirming the rating, for the next three years, it cannot move to a default category. Um, if it's a double A, I think they've got a timeline of one to two years. I need to go back on that. And if it's a single A rating, it cannot default in the next uh, six months. One so year, one year. Kind of, okay, one year. So it's a kind of uh, attempting to put greater uh, accountability on the rating agencies, uh, put greater pressure on them because uh, they will realize that, uh, you know, if they've kind of just done something uh, for, you know, gone along with management, taken an aggressive call on a particular rating, uh, then there are consequences uh, if the rating does not uh, kind of behave the way it's expected to. Okay, so uh, just to understand that, right, so they would calculate a probability of default based on, I assume, some formulas uh, that would exist or SEBI may prescribe, and they could only rate a security AAA if there is a zero uh, sort of default rate for one and two years, or probability of default rate for one and two years, for three years, again, zero with a tolerance level of 1%. So that means, sure. I mean, so... Uh, that uh, benchmark becomes uh, inherent in uh, rating somebody triple A is, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little confused about what that sure. means. Sure, look, uh, the way it means is that let's say everyone assumes that look, there's a 2% uh, default, that 2% uh, probability that, uh, uh, that the double A is going to default. But what happens is that, you know, typically you don't expect a double A to default in one year. Uh, you might expect it to happen over two to three years as it moves down. So if there's a double A rating, it kind of over one year it kind of stays double A, then it kind of moves to for the sake of the discussion triple B, and then it kind of moves to default or uh, the changes over three years. So that double A kind of moves to a default and it's kind of captured in your three year to default statistics. It's not likely to happen in that one year uh, period. Uh, now what they're saying is that, look, we expect that system-wide, uh, and those numbers will come out over a period of time, that double A default over three years is supposed to be 2%. Now if a rating agency comes back and says that, look, our default is 4%, uh, then SEBI is going to be asking them, look, why is it 4%? Now if it's a systemic issue that, look, everyone's kind of seen an uptick, uh, then SEBI might be a little bit more forgiving. But if it's only for one rating agency, uh, they're going to take uh, the hammer to them and ask them to kind of tighten their uh, uh, evaluation and their credit matrices. Okay. Would it also mean that a smaller subset of companies would qualify for a AAA or AA uh, once these you know, probability of default uh, ratings are calculated or uh, metrics are calculated? I, I, I would expect that, uh, look, so far the rating agencies have been able to get away by saying that, look, 90% uh, of it is the past, 10% is in the future. What this is doing is it's kind of pushing them to take a hard look. Uh, there are certain assumptions you make that, look, uh, some business will be sold and therefore I will get money. Uh, and therefore, I'm kind of hinting my rating on that. They'll have to kind of take a very hard call on something like that and say that, look, we are not going to give you the benefit of doubt in this instance, and therefore, the rating might move down. Okay. Or should move down. So, yes, you're right. There will be a tighter uh, uh, the universe of AAA and AA companies will uh, tighten. Okay. Uh, the other things that have been announced, Amit, so one is that, you know, sort of uh, credit enhancement suffix, that sounds, uh, you know, yeah. cosmetic to some extent. Uh, disclosure. It has implications, uh, Ira. It is, uh, you know, for a long time, the ratings are based on some degree of support. So let's look at Air India. Because of the guarantee, it may be AAA SO, but what uh, you to do is give a standalone rating, which could be a single B, meaning or even a lower category C, that it's likely to default and some of the instruments are defaulting. Uh, it's actually also very uh, useful in terms of the parent subsidiary uh, relationship because often you kind of say that, look, uh, the guarantee is there. Uh, what Sebi is saying is that, look, they want you to uh, mention, you know, do it uh, given credit enhancement only if there's an explicit guarantee. 
and if there is an explicit guarantee then you kind of give uh, the guarantee the rating of the parent plus the standalone rating of the, this entity so i think there is going to be far more granular information about the various credits so uh, while i i i don't treat that as a cosmetic change at okay. this moment i think it's significant and my sense again uh, what i understand since these conversations have been going on for a while is that uh, you know while they kind of uh, they're going to broaden what all comes under credit uh, credit enhancement over a period of time they're kind of testing the waters with this change so uh, hypothetically like you know this parental support which is built into uh, pretty much every uh, you know uh, company you know sure. uh, that gets covered not yet uh it does get uh, in a sense it does get covered because what they've uh, asked is for an explicit guarantee okay okay and so my sense is it does get captured now uh, you know someone might turn around and say it's uh, explicit because it shares the parents uh, parents name uh, they have both of the entities have the same name uh, they have you know uh, four of the board members uh, from the parent company out of the subsidiary so that's an assumption which someone will have to make but i think it's going to be more and more difficult with the passage of time okay uh, the liquidity indicators part amit last question uh, again there they have sort of standardized how you disclose it yeah. that should help too particularly in financial businesses uh, absolutely so therefore uh, they kind of are setting it uh, to start uh, giving commentary on disclosures now they have kind of got definitions i think it's also implicit in this is that look, if you are a triple a you can't uh, be in a environment where your liquidity uh, access to liquidity is low so by virtue of the fact that you're combining liquidity with the rating uh it means that look, if your liquidity is low then you have to be a lowly rated uh, rated entity of course you could be a lowly low rated entity with a high liquidity uh that's possible but the other way is not which is uh, sometimes what happens with uh, a lot of the debt instruments is that they're highly rated but when someone goes to uh, sell them uh, they have a huge impact cost and there's a uh 15 20 25% uh destruction of the nav which is taking place uh at the time of the sale so this is to address that issue and get to rating agencies to be a lot more thoughtful uh in terms of the liquidity and availability of liquidity in the market okay amit i will leave it there thank you so so much for helping us understand uh, some of the changes that sevi is trying to make uh, to the rating methodologies uh, you know obviously with the aim of uh, strengthening them thanks so much amit tandon there uh, let's move on uh, hexaware has just announced its biggest ever acquisition the tech company will acquire us based uh, mobiquity for 182 million dollars the company specializes in artificial in- artificial intelligence and has worked on amazon's alexa hexaware is hoping to grow its presence in the cloud and artificial in- intelligence space says ceo our shri krishna listening hexaware has a three prong strategy automate everything cloudify everything and transform customer experiences mobiquity will bring direct and substantial value in two of these three strategies transform customer experiences using the power of cloud right um let me give you uh, you know some examples right of how they do it um they bring together really nice strategy design and engineering capabilities N- not many companies are actually able to do that well together and they, they build products digital products this way but best off they do it like virtually 100% of the development is native on cloud in fact it is native on aws so so that's why it brings substantial value in two of our three strategies The jet heavy stock is down another 11% today after falling nearly 20% yesterday the drop can be attributed to uh, the national stock exchange notification moving the script from rolling to trade to trade segment uh, chances are that the exchanges could impose more restrictions in the coming days so what prompted the nsc to take such action and what implication does the move have on the stock uh, sajit mangat has the answer sajit that's right uh, you know the stock has fallen nearly 30% in the last couple of days and that's primarily because uh, the nsc has moved the stock from rolling settlement to trade to trade uh, which basically means uh, that uh, it is it will be more delivery based and not intraday netting off that the exchange is going to allow going forward now 
there are a couple of issues which Jet is uh, grappling with. Uh, one of them being uh, that uh, the financials for the uh, quarter ended March 31st hasn't been uh, announced and published yet. And uh, the company has informed the stock exchange uh, that the auditors are not able to, uh, you know, for um, are not able to get the signatures on the audit because uh, the board members and some of the key managerial personnel, so KMPs, have resigned from the from the board. Uh, the CEO, CFO, and the company secretary resigned in May uh, before the audited numbers could be presented to the board and as a result of which uh, the financials have not been signed yet. Uh, the regulations very clearly says uh, that uh, that uh, signature, uh, the board has to approve the results, final, uh, financial results for the annual uh, within 60 days and for the quarter within 45 days. That means that in case if JET is not able to furnish the results for two consecutive quarters uh, by, uh, by August 15th, uh, it will be heading towards a suspension of trading. Uh, the NSC has to follow a standard operating procedure wherein it will first have to transfer the stock to a Z category, uh, giving a seven day notice to all the members and uh, the stakeholders, and followed which it will give a, a notice of 21 days uh, before it goes ahead and suspends the stock. Once that happens, uh, uh, after a month after suspension, uh, uh, it goes into a grid uh, three surveillance wherein the stock will be allowed to trade only one day in a week or the first day of the week for the next six months. So in all prob uh, probability, it seems like that if JET is not able to furnish the two con uh, for Q1 results as well, it will be heading for a suspension of trading. Thanks so much for that, Sajid. SPI Mutual Fund increased its holding in banks last month. Yash Apadhyay is here to tell us what else was bought and sold by SPI Mutual Fund in May. Yash. Good afternoon, Ira. So uh, clearly, uh, the trend as far as the companies when they have increased their stake uh, uh, goes, uh, they have you know ex increased their exposure to the, the communication and financial names. Uh, I'll start first with the stocks when they have increased their holding, and uh, clearly, Vodafone Idea and Bharti Airtel they are right at the top. About 1.5 crore shares added in Vodafone India Idea, and about 82 lakh shares added in Bharti Airtel. The other three names from the financial pack: SBI, Bank of Baroda, and ICICI Bank, all of whom have seen buying anywhere between 36 lakhs to 60. 6 lakh shares in the month gone by but on the other on the other hand they have significantly reduced their exposure uh, in the likes of pharma and most importantly the IT names so Sipla uh, is where they have you know sold about close to 10 lakh shares uh, TCS Infosys are the other two names from the IT pack wherein they have sold uh, roughly around 7 to 8 lakh shares in the month of May and Aurobindo Pharma from the pharma pack again close to 7 lakh shares uh, sold there and right in between of them a consumer staple named Titan they have sold close to 8 lakh shares there uh, no new buys in the month of May so nothing new comes into their portfolio but a whole host of names uh, which go out completely uh, and a mixed bag over there no clear trends standing, uh, standing out but Gru Finance they have sold about 37 lakh shares Apollo Tires Everest Industries anywhere between 12 to 8 and a half lakh shares sold uh, Reliance Nippon and Sandar Tech are the other two names that stand out for from the list a 2.8 lakh shares sold in Reliance Nippon and about two and a half lakh shares in Sandar Technologies thanks so much for that uh, the Niti Aayog has drawn up an ambitious plan to make it mandatory for all two-wheelers and three-wheelers to turn electric by 2026. Uh, but Atul Auto, uh, one of the few companies that are already selling electric three-wheelers, says that financiers are not ready to finalize a proper scheme for electric vehicles. Uh, the company's president, uh, Jitendra Adya, says that in turn, uh, that this in turn impacts sales as majority of three-wheelers are bought on finance and is used for commercial purposes. Listen in. Three-wheeler entire mar market characteristic is such that uh, 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 close to 70-75% uh, uh, buyers are uh, free load operators. They buy it for their uh, self-employment and they are largely depend upon the uh, retail finance availability. Now, none of the financiers as of now is ready with, uh, you know, any uh, kind of policies or financing schemes for EV. They, they, they definitely uh, would like to understand the success of the product first and then they will come out. Uh, and again, uh, this 70% of the end users, since they are dependent on, uh, you know, for their bread and butter on this particular asset, here uh, the economy of the vehicle plays a very important role. When uh, the uh, initial acquisition cost is higher, uh, definitely they, they need to look for a higher uh, quantum of loan and uh, obviously they have to pay a higher EMI and uh, at the same time unless uh, there is you know the price benefit 
and uh, the comparability with the conventional vehicle is not at par. I, I, I have my own apprehensions that uh, in three-wheeler segment, people would come forward for uh, this particular product. Co-working space startup WeWork is looking to increase its holding in the Indian arm. Uh, the shared office uh, startup currently operates a franchisee model with BuildCon LLP, uh, which is owned by Jitu Virmani and his son. Uh, Sarita Rai of Bloomberg News reports on the plan changes. Uh, IPOs haven't really been doing that well this year, uh, especially really high profile ones. And WeWork is going uh, in for an IPO uh, and is about to file paperwork. So this uh, consolidation is really important for WeWork to show that their financials are really solid and their assets are solid too. So yes, it's a critical deal for them. On to oil prices now, which rose after two oil tankers were attacked in the Persian Gulf near the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, the U.S. administration has blamed Iran for the attacks and claimed that Iran is looking to disrupt the crude supply chain. Uh, listening to what U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo told reporters last night. The United States government that the Islamic Republic of Iran is responsible for the attacks that occurred in the Gulf of Oman today. This assessment is based on intelligence, the weapons used, the level of expertise needed to execute the operation, recent similar Iranian attacks on shipping, and the fact that no proxy group operating in the area has the resources and proficiency to act with such a high degree of sophistication. And in response to this, Iran has said that it uh, categorically rejects U.S. unfounded claim with regard to this attack. Uh, Derek Wallbank of Bloomberg News brings us this update. Iran's mission to the UN just in the last couple of minutes came out, said it categorically re rejects all of the, uh, what it calls, quote, the U.S.'s unfounded claim uh, with regards to these attacks. And, and that's that's important here uh, because Iran had been accused by the United States of being behind this. I think some of the uh, evidence that, that uh, Mike Pompeo outlined, I mean, look, they're, they're talking about, uh, they're talking about some, some preliminary stuff of videos pictures, things of that nature. Uh, there is, There are U.S. assets on site. The USS Bainbridge is on site. Uh, U.S. ships were quick to respond to this because the Fifth Fleet, uh, which is which is one of the uh, United States' largest military presences, the Fifth Flight Fleet is based in that, uh, in that area. So they were quick to respond. They've been on scene. In terms of public stuff, uh, it, it gets a little bit harder. Uh, one of the logic points that Pompeo was laying out there really was, was a sort of... Uh, uh, commission by omission, the idea that Iran is probably responsible because it's right next to them and nobody else operating in that area is even possibly up to uh, up to the ability of doing this. It was sort of the logic that, that uh, Pompeo laid out. But I've got to say, it's really tricky here, uh, and having covered this for a while, one of the things that's hardest here is that you don't see all of the evidence that's sort of behind the scenes here. Uh, the U.S. isn't quick to necessarily put out some things that may or may not still be classified. So it's very, very likely that as we're trying to react to this and traders are trying to price oil and figure out new risk threats, that we're operating in a little bit of an information asymmetry here. Netflix is now looking to venture into online gaming space. Uh, the on-demand platform has commissioned developers to build video games around its popular shows like Stranger Things. Take a look. That's a wrap on this edition of Power Lunch. Thanks for watching.